Yeah. Alright, so guys, we're back. This is an IWS interview with Sensei. A number... What number are we on? I have no idea. But we have a special guest tonight. Mm -hmm. This is Edward Hall. One of our top students at Godashin Dojo, part of Nijigakin, Nijigakin Ru. Mm -hmm. And um, we're going to be talking about dreams tonight. Mm -hmm. Dreams, and I guess what their meanings are, and, and how they apply to our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, in a martial way, I guess? Can we do that? Sure. Um, really, if we get into dreams, you got to go like kind of classical, maybe talk about some of the mysticism that was in martial arts. Um, and then we can kind of go modern and talk about the modern belief. But classically, uh, you know, you had your, your conscious mind, your subconscious mind. And they believed that we exist in these three dimensions, right? And we are trapped by this fourth dimension, which is time. We have an understanding of this. We got, you know, length, width, height. And then your fourth dimension is time. There's a fifth dimension, which is the field of all possibilities. Uh, that field can be touched by the subconscious mind, stating that we don't just exist in these four dimensions, we actually, uh, we exist in the four dimensions, our physical body does, and our mind exists in the fifth dimension, and there's a couple of beliefs there. Uh, the fifth dimension being that field of all possibilities, everything that is possible, the unmanifest, whereas these fourth these four dimensions represent the manifest, the fifth dimension represents the unmanifest. Our spirit exists trapped in these four dimensions, right? But also exists in the fifth dimension. Why? How? Because we are dead. We are dead outside of time. This is a very strange concept. When we die, whether you die tomorrow, whether you die 60 years from now, right, you're an old, super old geezer, you, die, you kick off, you will be pulled out of time. So you, you will be around to see your birth, and you'll be around to see your death, and you'll be around to see your great-great-grandchildren's death and their birth. You exist outside of time. Well, that means that you are dead right now, mm. right? Right. Yeah. Because you exist outside it, of time. Within the fifth dimension. And that is what the ancients referred to as the higher self. Hmm. So, in your dream state, through training, it would be possible to contact yourself, your higher self, through the gateway of the fifth dimension. This is the belief. And where did this, where did this belief come from? There wasn't a lot to do in ancient Japan. There wasn't a lot to do? <laughs> no. So, so no. They just... <laughs> wasn't like you had TV to take, take up your time. True, true, you know, true, you, true, true. You, you talked to everybody in your little village, you worked your ass off, mm -hmm. and then and then what? <laughs> right? It's true. You want to strive for more, but you're cast in a cast system. You're locked in, so you, there's no leaving it. So what are you going to do? You're going to try to develop the self. You're going to try, and really because there's a lot of pressure that comes from the fear of death and this concept of impending doom because you know there's not much on these islands and everybody wants to take from everybody else so eventually they're gonna be taken from you so it was like you know I'm gonna die soon so there was like this realization of like I need to express everything I need to express I need to get everything done and done that I can get done I need to try to make a lasting impression on this world right? But how are you going to do that? What are you going to teach your children? And the, the concept is to go further. So go further with knowledge. You know, everything from this is how you tie on a shirt. This is a better way to tie on a shirt. Our family ties on this shirt the best way because we learned from great-grandfather, right? But it, it, let's go even further. Let's go into this is how you unlock your spirit. This is how you find a, a, a refined uh, essence of who you are and what you're here to do. This is how you become spiritually strong. This is how you become in tune with, with the whole. And dreams were an intricate part of that. You know, often dreams are looked at as like this mismatch of, of God knows what the hell went on while I was sleeping, mm -hmm. but thank God I'm through it. Mm -hmm. 
Oh god, I've had dreams like that. Right. Like where I'm like, you know, getting murdered and like you wake up like, oh my god, I'm so glad it was a dream. Oh my god. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, and and then you have this then you have dreams where you you, you know, you're getting to this point where Oh my gosh, I'm about to fly, and then, yay, I can fly, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you wake up, and you're like, what the heck was that about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, they tried to delve into all of life because they knew that soon it would be taken from them. Mm. So, and, and they were big on documentation. So, you know, they, they, there was Kuden, this direct transmission to their, their siblings and to their, their offspring. But there was also uh, written documentation of, like, this is where you want to go in your dreams, and this is what you want to accomplish with them. Use them as a guide. So, where's the oil, especially in modern day application, where we, how does this transition from this ancient belief and this very, you know, mystical idea of dimensions to a modern day age where we're very scientifically based? You know, this type of thing people tend to write off as, you know, pixie dust and fairies. Uh, I'm with you there, I get that. Uh, the, here's the application. The application is, if we excuse all of the deeper concepts and we just go at it, and we don't want to, we want to delve into those deeper concepts, but if we just excuse them for a second and we just take things on face value, dreams are about the subconscious running protocol. And protocol is survival and coping. That's what it is. The, the, uh, I've said it before in different interviews where we talk about the subconscious being a, a computer. It's working, trying to figure out the solutions to things. It's computing and it's taking things that may be correlated and may not be correlated and finding the correlation and creating associations, hopefully beneficial associations, but often just associations. Some, some associations are very non-beneficial. This thinking <laughs> calculator, right, of a subconscious, is trying to calculate how you react and what you will do with um, a random situation. Right, a, a yeah. situation I've, in I've which that. That happens your lot. girlfriend cheats on you. How are you going to deal with that? Mm -hmm. And if you don't deal with it well, if, if the subconscious feels that you may die from it or, or you didn't do good enough, You'll, they'll run that scenario again. You're like, oh, jeez, I have this reoccurring dream where this continually happens to me. We've all had those. Mm -hmm. And that's because the subconscious is like, you didn't learn shit, let's run it again. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to get this right. We're going to keep running it until we get it right. We're going to keep... So in a modern-day scientific approach, the approach would be you wake up, and you notice that you've had this dream before, and you realize that you have a serious weakness here. There is an insecurity, or there is something lacking. There's a uh, the, this feeling of the the bottom falling out from underneath your feet, and uh, and we need to fill in the gaps, and we need to we need to create a stable foundation for ourselves. There's something spiritually, mentally, or physically lacking, and. Uh, our coping strategies are failing and our subconscious is taking us to, to ground zero over and over again to find so that we can find solace believe it or not that that doesn't sound right it sounds like we're being tortured every night but the torture just comes from the lack of ability and the lack of know-how and the, and the unknowing or the, or the Lack of uh, comfortability and a lack of knowledge of what the hell, what the heck am I going to do? I've been a martial artist my whole life, and I have had this dream. And, and I know if you guys out there say you didn't have this dream, then you weren't training hard. Mm. Okay, this is a real dream, and this this is a result of understanding combat, and this is a result of being in combat. Okay. Here's the dream. This guy's attacking me, and he's whipping punches at me. He's pulling stuff out and attacking me. Knives on bats, and he's got friends that are coming. And this is me hitting him. Yes, I've had that happen. I've definitely had that happen. Go faster! Oh, yeah, well, you're moving mad. What stuff. the hell? Yeah. <laughs> 
and he's just whipping punches around me, blah, 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 and I'm watching him hit me, uh, uh, uh. and I'm wondering how much I can take before I go down, before he kills me, and then I figure I should throw a kick, <laughs> and a slow motion, <laughs> I've had that happen, what is that dream about, that dream is about coping with failure, that dream is about understanding that, what if you're not fast enough, what if you're not good enough, Let's just say you get the living hell beat out of you. How do you deal with it mentally? How are you going to deal with that spiritually, emotionally? How are you going to cope with that? And I didn't do well emotionally. Mm. So, so my subconscious was like, run it again. <laughs> run it again. Put him in there. Make him do it. How about the dream where you're falling off the cliff? All the time. Right? Yeah. Uh, what is that about? question. <laughs> we know what that's about. We know what that's about. It's not, you know, so many people throughout time have, have said that this represents this, this represents this, and they try to find the representation. And sometimes they go off in left field. If the ground falls out from underneath your feet, do you know what that means? The ground is falling out from underneath your feet. Right. The emotions felt, because your subconscious is, knows you the best, okay? So when people try to, people, people try to find your association, I always think that's funny. What the real question is, let's say you fall off the side of a building. Which building was it? What does that building mean to you? How old were you when you were on that building or in that building? What association do you get with that building? Now that association tells you the emotional state that your subconscious wanted to put you in to get this scenario to work. That's all it is. If it's a hill, if it's a, if it's a mountain, if, it, if you're riding your skateboard, and then what feelings do you associate with your skateboard? What age, what, what time were you in? And what, what feelings are brought up from that time period? That is the starting point that your subconscious wanted to run the scenario from. Mm -hmm. It wanted to deal with those emotions, those feelings, and it wanted to tug at those feelings, and it wanted to test, pressure test those feelings. Your reactions. Mm -hmm. Now, I remember having a dream where, and I came to you about it, mm -hmm. it was a reoccurring dream of being stabbed. You remember that? Mm -hmm. I came to I'm you sure, yeah. maybe a little while ago, yeah. and I told you, I said, since I really don't feel comfortable with knife attacks right now, I need to learn more about you know how to defend myself and how to how to take care of that situation because this was a reoccurring dream mm -hmm. that some dude was just you know coming up to me and just stabbing yeah. his stomach and I'm just like Ugh! it was scared the hell out of me sure, yeah. I woke up and I was like oh my god I didn't react fast enough mm -hmm. I really didn't have a technique in mind to deal with which is I have a crap load that I've learned but I just couldn't pick one fast enough which kept me in frozen but that might have been what it was about right so then when I came to you about it you showed me all the different techniques. You said, you know, move, move, move out of the line. You know, uh, tenkara or not tenkara or uh, uh, koho nanamashi. You know, to get out of the way. You gave me a whole bunch of different things that I could do to handle a knife attack. And the dream stopped. Mm. I've never had the dream again. Mm. So I think, from my experience, it's like these dreams that reoccur will go away once you found the solution. It can be that. It can be that. But it, it often it often is a spiritual thing. What I mean by spirit is, you know, emotions are the language of the spirit. And we need to attach a, a specific... There's a goal in mind. The subconscious has a goal in mind. And that is not just survival. Well, often it is survival. Because often there's like death... It's like a death-defying dream. And you don't make it. You wake up just before you die. You know? Oh, yeah. But... <clears throat> But there's a goal in mind. There's, the goal is to asso to create a positive association. When when your when your subconscious takes you to a point of overload, that's on purpose. It's like I know this guy because this guy's me, right? And he's as accessing your memories. If you just pictured like a third party, but it's not a third party; it's you. Right. But a third party playing with your conscious mind, right? Conscious mind sleeping. What are we gonna do? We're gonna access his memories. We're gonna find out what makes. I know exactly what makes this guy tick, and I know how to get under this man's skin. I know that this is gonna do it. This is something that's lacking. So when you started training those those knife reactions, 
you may have attached a positive emotion to the knife attack. So that no longer, it's not that, here's the interesting thing, it's not that you fixed the dream, it's that that scenario won't work anymore to play the un unconscious game. I see. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. That, we're going to have to, because he likes that now. Right. We need now to know what to do. do. So now we got to switch this. We got to switch this up, right. and we got to find something that he, that that he's not going to deal with, that he's not going to cope with. And it's all geared toward survival and making you stronger. Mm -hmm. You know, it's you know, it's, if we look at a psychological standpoint, when I was going to college, you know, I I would ask about this, like, what's the modern concept? And it wasn't so foreign from what we're discussing. But the the modern concept was that it came from. Some psychologists believe that it comes from, um, like a like a, almost like a, the lizard mind, the 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 part of the brain that is just geared towards survival, the part of the brain that's afraid of falling out of the tree, so the saber toothed tiger is going to eat us. Mm. You know, <laughs> the, fight or flight. the fight or flight, the the, the uh oh, you know, you got to run, caveman, you got to run. You know? That's that sort of thing, and perhaps it is. Um, I know for a fact that glances, <laughs> I know where it comes from. You know, I've been a student of body language for so long that a glance means a lot to me. So in my dream, there'll be glances. Oh, you know, this person will look at me a certain way. And then it'll churn up this emotion in me. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, so maybe no longer do I have these falling off of buildings, but my subconscious still knows how to get me. Still knows how to jab at me and say, well, what would you do if this happened? Mm -hmm. you know. So how does, what, if any at all, is the rationale behind why your, your subconscious chooses, you know, the order to deal with these scenarios? Why does it choose this A over B? what it feels you can deal with at this moment. You know, there there will be times where it decides to go at you a certain way, and it'll be so extreme that you'll wake up almost like a night terror. And for most of us, our subconscious is like, he's not ready for that. We, we gotta go at this another way. And the next time you're there, it'll be more comfortable. It's not like your subconscious will let it go. It's just going to go at it a little bit more comfortable. One thing that you can do in your dreaming is, is um, uh, lucid dreaming, in which you in which you wake up in a dream. Have you guys done this? No, I've always wondered how to do yeah, this. And doesn't that this. defeat the purpose of the dream? Because then, yes. then your conscious mind is controlling the dream state. Totally defeats it. What? I missed that. Okay. So if the purpose of the dream is scenario training, and you wake up in the dream, and you're falling off a cliff, and you go, there's no cliff. Oh, right. So We're in a meadow. Oh, I see. Okay, so yeah, it defeats the rest of the dream. It defeats the purpose of the dream. Yeah. I've already done this. I Was it two nights ago? You know, I had a lucid dream. Uh -oh. I go up to the guy, and I go, I go, it would be cooler. <laughs> Just walking up to this one guy. And I, and I said, it would be cooler if, in the dream, if you were Greg Duncan, and he boom, he turns into Greg Duncan, and I was like, and you're gonna be, and you're gonna be, and I just started creating these people as different martial artists. Oh wow! And then I said, and now we're all going to demonstrate our skills, and it wasn't a martial arts demonstration, but I just made it a martial arts demonstration because I thought it'd be fun. And <laughs> they're demonstrating these incredible skills, and I'm, I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, this is a lot of fun. Now there are other times in which. I'll be in this scenario and I'll start to wake up and I'll get to choose. Should I, should I wake up? Ah, no, no. Because I am often in control of the dream state. Now, I'm not 100% in control. There are times where my subconscious has me so fooled. And my subconscious is one crafty bastard. I'll go, <laughs> I'll say to myself, this is a dream. I know this is a dream. And then my subconscious will go, well, it's not a dream because of this. And I'll go, holy crap, it's not a dream. And I get tricked back into it being a dream. But uh, but then, you know, you wake up, you learn that that's what your subconscious does, and then the next time you're in there, you 
go, it's not, a, it's not a dream because of this. And I go, it's definitely a dream because of that, because that never happens in reality. You know? uh, <laughs> and it'll, it'll, it'll go, you know, it'll be like this battle. So when you start to rationalize it, you, you take control of it. Is that how it works? Oh, once you have this loose, once you, once you can attain lucid dreaming, you really ruin the program. I mean, when I was a teenager, <laughs> I don't know if I should tell this story, but when I was a teenager, I start, I first started working on lucid dreaming. So I remember watching this stupid movie called Children of the Corn, and it scared me, and I didn't, I wasn't scared, because I'm a teenager, and I'm not scared. I go to sleep, I have this dream, this freaking old scary lady is chasing me through a cornfield. I turn, she's chasing me, I'm running, I'm running, I'm like, how the heck did I get in a cornfield? <laughs> and then I go, I'm dreaming. I turn around, she's running at me, and I go, you're a blonde. Mm. Just boom. You're in a bikini. Dang. Boom. And you're about to take it. <laughs> and I changed it and it turned into a very different dream. Wow. But that's what you can do with lucid dreaming. With lucid dreaming. I've never done it. Hmm. But how much are you really learning? I mean, it's, it's great entertainment. But how much are you, get, are you really learning? How much are you really gathering? Well, getting into this dream state, what's really interesting about this dream state when we okay if, if we get if we kind of jump topics are you guys aware of this concept called zazen it's a practice yeah, i've heard of it but i don't know what it is it's like the fastest way to zen okay. it. so the zen buddhism zazen is a specific order okay. and they're brutal and this guy called a goto and he beats you with a bamboo reed so you're you're meditating on mu which is nothing and he comes over and he cracks you when you, he believes that you are either distracted or you are not distracted. So it's a lose-lose. Or a win-win, depending. So, this, this order is, it's about getting it done. Other people meditate on Zen for 30 years and hope to attain something. Zazen is the fastest way to roam. You're going to get it in three years. You're going to get it because we're going to force you into Zen. This concept is this attainment of Mu, of nothingness. Now, here's the interesting thing creativity, okay, is about single, is, is about the singularity. Is it, it's about the focused thought combined with what? The nothingness. That which does not yet exist. Mm. Creativity, right? Okay. So we need to combine what we know with what we don't know. We don't know. Mm. That is crazy. Okay. And that, in those instances in which you feel brilliant for a second, that, that spark is said to have come from the fifth dimension. It's, it's not stating that it comes from you. You are an amalgamation of your experiences and what you've been taught, right? That's what you are. Right? This inspiration that we feel inside of us has nothing to do with that. I see that. This Makes thing sense. that comes, this spark, where does it come from? Mm -hmm. This thing that no one ever thought to do before. A music, right? Was inspired by thousands of things. But this stream, where did this come from? This brand new symphony? I've never heard this before. I'm creating it. Wait a second. If you're creating something, it's coming from the field of possibilities. This fifth dimension. It's hard to make it quantitative. It's hard to state that this is built in science and facts. Oh, yeah, but we could make it quantitative. It wasn't, um, wasn't the revolver invented in two opposite ends of the world at the same time? This is string theory. That we're talking about <laughs> that's the chimpanzee what, what separated us from um, from animals right what separated us we could say speech but dolphins have speech we could say um, we're smart well lots of animals are smart mm -hmm. so what separated us was the use of tools that was that was the number one thing mm -hmm. right for, for forever it was like we create and use tools no one else does that well, chimpanzees, one, 
one in the zoo, one in the jungle, same exact time. We monitor them. For, we, we've been monitoring them for, for forever. As long as we found them, you know, as soon as we found them, we were like, whoa, what's that? And we started, you know, watching their behavior. And we, you know, we've been on them. Like, look at that creature. That's an amazing creature. We've been studying them, documenting what they do. So we've never seen them use a tool before. They both use them within the same week. They take a twig, they take the leaves off of it, they fashion it, they, and they use it to grab ants out of an anthill and they lick it off the stick. Never has a chimpanzee do, done this before, but they both figured out how to do this, both decided to, oh, or they both tapped into that fifth dimension at the same point because they, as a species, perhaps evolved spiritually to such a level that it was time to do it. I believe in the elevation of consciousness that a species will elevate to a specific point and then the breakthrough will happen. I don't believe the Industrial Revolution came because of a few men. Yes and no. Our society was ready to evolve. That's what I believe. Right? If it happened, if it happened, just think about this. If it happened a couple of years prior to, wouldn't people be have been burned alive as witches? Mm -hmm. Right? Wouldn't it have? Yeah, the timing you, is everything. I, I do believe that it is about an elevation of consciousness. I mean, wouldn't they have strung you up and said, "What? You, what do you want to do? That is the devil's work. You want to make things move without horses? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like." <laughs> You know, that, that you can't do that. Satan! Right? I mean, turn you up. Oh, yeah. 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 So, this is what fire was meant for. <laughs> Cleansing. So in your belief, what's the ceiling? What's the ceiling? There is no ceiling. Well, the ceiling is, is God, God consciousness, God's mind. And we're never getting there, so. <laughs> well, you can get so there. we're safe. Read the Bible. Don't get all that. You're not getting to God. Yeah. Tower of Babel, man. Don't even try. Oh, do the word. You get there. You did it once before. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was the, uh, their way physically to try and get to God. Try to overthrow I'm God. Saying, I'm saying through his word you can get to God. Uh, we, can, we can touch on it. I don't believe that we'll ever get there. But I don't believe... Here's the thing. I do believe an elevation of consciousness as a species. Mm -hmm. Right? So we all... Here's an interesting thing. I mean, you, you heard about it in the news... This is kind of gross, but ja the Japanese finally got it. Japanese finally decided that um, that uh, child pornography is bad. <gasps> Isn't that exciting? Oh, that just that just came. <laughs> they canceled us within the yeah. Oh wow, moment. we've got a new. It's wrong yes. now. Oh, they're still allowed to do it in anime, in Japanese animation, and all the previous porn that was purchased that was child porn. That's okay. That's grandfathered in. Oh, my God. But no new. That's a start. Really? Now, here's an interesting thing, right? Wow, I got here's an interesting that. thing. <laughs> this is a cross-cultural idea. I mean, you go to Mexico, you go to you go to anywhere else in the world, mm. and everybody's pretty much on that level. We have elevated our consciousness mm. to a point where we are like, no, children and sex do not mix. That is disgusting. We do not do that, right? Mm. And it just took a little while for the Japanese to catch on. Damn, so they're just catching on now? I mean, I think socially, I believe that many of them thought it was wrong. But? Nobody said anything because they didn't want to get, like... It's about this... It's a different culture over there. And you don't rock the boat over there. And you don't... You it's know. weird on the trains there, right? They every, Nobody talks. They're just like... You know, it's just very... Uh, there's, there's just a specific time to greet someone. There's a specific time. There's a specific greeting. There's a specific um, uh, way you respond. It's not like here where I'm like, hey, how's it going? And you're like, what's up? Or you can say whatever the heck you want. You don't do that in Japan. This is a, this specific, is a specific. That is weird. Time. So for them to create change quickly, they have it in certain accepted areas of their society. So nobody spoke against child pornography until now in Japan. I'm sure they, I'm sure they were, but they speaking, take and they were dismissed. So oh wow! I'm sure that's happened. I'm sure that. Oh my it's probably been a, a very difficult journey for this to pass. Well, we should. But it's finally passed. We should have a celebration for them. I, heck yeah! Moving up. <laughs> Moving up. <laughs> you know, 
you know, and, and really, we should have a celebration. Really, we should have a celebration for us. For us. Because this is an elevation of consciousness. This is, we all benefit. When, when one of us moves up, we all move up. Yes, we all true. benefit from that. Um, but we're kind of off topic. The dream bit. The dream thing. <laughs> the, <laughs> seriously, I'm talking. But what we were talking about is an elevation of consciousness. As soon as you can get through all of your, what if this gets you, what that gets what if this, what if this, then you will probably have financial dreams about, you know, possibly losing your job or, or a huge bill comes in the mail or something. And you get through that. And then you'll have perhaps a, and it may not be in this order, but you might have, you know, your fiancé dumping you or, or you know, your, ch your child screaming that they hate you or whatever. And you get through this, and then you'll you'll start having comfortable dreams for a while, and then it'll it'll take a turn. And you might think it's taking a turn for the worse, but it's not. And it's all about building you up. It's all about elevating you, and it's all about uh, dealing with crisis and and how to move beyond. Well, guys, then just constant improvement. Constant all circumstances are always changing, so you have to adapt with the changing of the circumstances. Absolutely. Adapt while applying everything that you've learned thus far that's kept you alive, kept you, kept you going. Um, it's all about OU. It's all about application. So, so on a spiritual level, what are we doing with these dreams? Well, the, the concept was to a access through that fifth dimension, the sixth dimension, where we live when we're not living. Where we exist when, when we die to tap into our higher selves. When Christians talk about their higher self, some Christians don't even talk about it. When Christians talk about their higher self, often they're talking about their guardian angels, right? This is a different concept. This is like a guardian angel, but it's actually you. It's when you're dead. Or before you were born. That's kind of a strange concept, but remember, we're like a loop. Assassins often call. Uh, assassins have an interesting saying. They'll, they'll say, um, I, "I ended the loop, or I completed the loop, I finished the loop." What they're talking about is, "I closed the loop. I, I, I killed the guy." But, but what are they talking about? You came from here. And what do you do? You go back there. Um, that that concept was before I was born and after I'm dead. I exist here. The book, the, the Bible says that. Before and after are putting things in terms of the timeline. I don't think our perception of time is kind of off. It's not it's perfect. necessarily chronological. Where we are. <laughs> it's not necessarily chronological. It, it is no longer chronological. All right. Well, in the book of Ephesians, it says, God created us, I think it's the first chapter, God created us, before the foundations of the earth, meaning we existed before earth was even made in the f in the fifth dimension. Sixth. sixth dimension. Fifth is like the crossover. Okay. But sixth is sixth is that spiritual plane. Mm -hmm. Seventh is where where the creator is. Okay. So wherever he was is where he created us and then he created the earth. Right. Through the field of all possibilities. That's like the it's like the ether that some people talk about. They call it that, where where all the ideas come from, mm -hmm. and where everything, like as a, as a carpenter or as a, as a remodeler, I my father said this for years. He's had things built. You know, he walks into a place and he, and he can see it all built. I developed that skill from him, and I can I can do that. Mm -hmm. I walk in and I go, oh, well, that's where the kitchen's going to be, and that's and then you know the person will say, oh, I don't want the kitchen there, and I go, huh? I have to like. Destruct it, <laughs> like deconstruct it, because it's it's done in my head. Deconstruct it, okay. Kitchen's going over there, okay. I got okay. I'm there with you. Kitchen's already built again, in my mind. That's being brought. If we believe this, is being brought from the fifth dimension into time. In our minds, it doesn't it doesn't exist. Here's the interesting thing. It doesn't have length, width, right height. Oh, but it does in our minds, and it exists within time. We 
because at the, during those moments I was thinking about it, I had created it. It will always exist. Everything that exists now will always exist now. That's kind of weird. Right? This conversation, can't take it back, it will always be here. Existing always, at this time. This is, uh, this is uh, I'm trying to remember, the Deepak Chopper talks a lot about this. He does. Deepak talks a lot about it. And here's an interesting thing, the Bible speaks of it too. It talks about speech and how, how dangerous it is and how important it is. Because, because we're birthing things into existence. Mm -hmm. The whole concept behind that, why is it wrong to curse? Because you're taking it from the fifth dimension and you're creating it, making it reality. You're using this vessel to create. And what are you creating? And what are you cementing in time? Mm -hmm. That judgment, that hatred. You can't go back in time and say, I, you know what, I'm not a hateful person. I don't want to hate during that day. Oh, nope, it's cemented in time forever. It's a dangerous thing. I think about that often as a married man, how I want to treat my wife. Think about who your wife is to you. She's my, my love, my darling, my everything. And yet when we, when we bicker and we fight, I think, oh my gosh, I cemented that moment. Dear God, it's dangerous. But theoretically, if we talk about this loop, you know, before you're born and after you die, that moment was already cemented before it happened. Not to us. Not yeah. to us because we're in Just time. to existence. In and yo. It always existed. It always will exist. It hasn't existed yet. It may exist. It may not. Both are absolutely true. This is a Mikio teaching. It's kind of difficult. <laughs> but both are absolutely true and because of that both reflect how false each one is and that's what makes them true the light and the dark intermixing to create the gray universe that we live in and we don't exist in the gray universe is just a transcendence to the truth the gray universe is not just about the transcendence into the truth things to transcend, things to remove, things to accept, to appreciate. But we're really getting off the dream thing. Sorry. <laughs> but we can go into that next. That. <laughs> we'll go into that next. We'll go into that next. Sounds good. And cut. Technique, Technique of the week. The week. What you learned here? Was he kicked down the wall? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I learned here? What I learned at the um, okay. um, Well, I learned to always get out of the way and put something in the way. Shoot it. Strike from position down and see And then attack with the weapon the whip. And move. Change your position of dominance, get your hands free the ne for the next guy. Okay, there's one each over there. There's one each over there. I learned that there's more than one level of combat. There's standing, there's also the knee, and then my knee up. Um, I learned that getting struck isn't the end of the world. And you move from that. And from this point, start your intimidation. Otherwise, you want to look humble and weak. Meek, not weak. Uh, I learned some cool throws. Learn some cool locks, too. Here. It's not bad if unless it's not hit. Not hit? No. And if you can't attain the break, from shift to the hips. Fire stories. All right. So we've got we've got a special guest Ed Hall with us from the Nijigakin Ru Godesh and Dojo, one of our top ranking students. Mm -hmm. um, Pleasure to have you here, sir. Excellent. And I Excellent. never got a chance to ask you, what brought you to the dojo? What brought you to 
martial arts. Probably a pretty terrible reason they don't want me saying the camera. But, uh, hey, we uh, share a lot of weird and awkward <laughs> things <laughs> during this fire session. Yeah, <laughs> true. So um, you're all right. Excellent, excellent. Uh, I want I want him to beat the living crap out of people. <laughs> um, not not the purest of motivations, but you know I joined. Uh, let's see, well I started in in Tung Sudo and. Seventh grade, and then in eighth grade, I found you guys and, and came over here because I thought it would uh, help me learn to beat people up faster. But the reason I wanted to beat people up was, uh, you know, in in uh, middle school, I was very in early high school, I was very into the theater scene, so that wasn't necessarily well received by you know, some of the groups of of kids. And you know, looking back on it, kids are kids are kids, kids are mean, and probably it's not as big of a deal as my 14-year-old mind blew it up to be. But at that time, I just was pissed at the world and pissed at them for making fun of me. So I'm like, what better way to get back at them and beat their faces? So that's uh, that's why I wanted to join. I remember my, my first class, I wanted to show up all tough in the dojo and I wore my Kung Sudo shirt. And then uh, I was like, yeah, I got this. And uh, the rest is history. I joined and you know was welcomed into the family and been on a long journey, a continuing journey. And I've since rid myself of the desires to beat people up and you know, it's been a fun ride. Yeah, you know the thing about beating people up is you're you're only beating up yourself because we've all been there and in a very real sense we're all one. This uh, this illusion of separation is, is only that. It's an illusion. So what uh, what would you what would you take? We always tell a story, and then we, you know, what's the lesson? What would you take? What's the lesson behind um, your journey into martial arts? What did, what did you learn? What would you say to those that would be maybe in the same shoes as you? I uh, I would say it's it's not worth it. <laughs> As far as not the martial arts aspect, but the, the holding on to the, the hatred and the holding on to the, the anger and, you know, the, the negative feelings. It's, all it does is, is weigh you down and it, it becomes, a, you know, becomes an infection that just passes on to every other aspect of your life. That's really well put, the infection. I, I heard a saying, it's one of my favorites, and uh, it's... <laughs> Holding on to it's about holding on to hatred. Hating another person is like poisoning yourself, wishing the other person would die. I thought that was pretty good because that's that. that's what you're doing. You know, you're holding on to that hate. I think another good lesson would be. I don't want to be presumptuous, but another good lesson would be whatever gets you there, whatever gets you motivated <laughs> to train, get in the dojo and train. Whatever gets you there, and you know what? Um, I think the dojo. Is about straightening out those problems. So maybe you have those issues and you want to beat the, sh the cr you want to beat people up, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but when you get in and, and you get acclimated, hopefully you find a better way. I would, I would agree, hundred percent. Whatever whatever the the motivation is, you know, there's there's a reason you're motivated in that way. And just as I was accepted in, we'll we'll accept everyone else and help you either work through whatever you might be going through or, you know, whatever help you may need. We're, we're here to support each other, not just through the physical training, but through the mental and the spiritual aspect of it as well. And it's great to have Ed present, too, because that way if we get people that come to the dojo with the same mindset, he would be the one we'd, we'd say, hey, you need to go talk to Ed about this, man. He came in with the same mentality and yeah. help you with knowing what, with what it's going to turn into. Yeah. You know, maybe I haven't been there. Maybe I haven't done that, but this guy has. Right. Yeah. And that's what's cool about the dojo is everybody in the room has come from the different martial arts, different places. So what is the difference? I was just wondering, what's the difference between Tuxedo, what's it called? Tung Sudo. Tung Sudo. And, and, and Sogu Jiu Jitsu. Um, I want to preface this with I trained in Tung Sudo for six months before I found Sogu Jiu Jitsu. So. If I misinterpret anything beyond an orange belt's understanding, I apologize <laughs> in advance. I'd um, just like to put that disclaimer out there. Um, you get your arms though. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty dedicated. Um, well, they skip the other belt. Oh. Oh. And at least the school I was at, it, it went from white to orange. Oh. 
so I don't know if that's different from the other tonsillar structures. But um, it was, you know, and from what I gathered in the beginning, it, it's essentially Taekwondo. And then I uh, had the privilege of witnessing one of my classmates attain their black belt, and she had worked several years uh, to get it. You know, and by several, I think it was about four. And then when she started working on some of her upper rank requirements, it was a lot of Hapkido. Yeah. So it just seemed like um, it, is, it is Korean derived, so it makes sense to me that they kind of took Taekwondo and um, Hapkido and kind of mashed them together. It's funny, that's kind of what for me this one was with the Hapkido, because before I came, I was a part of Taekwondo. And we would rarely, like on the weekends, we would do Hapkido. And that was the best part. I didn't. I mean, I loved learning how to kick. I loved learning my distance with my feet. But uh, when when uh, sensei would come in, uh, Sabanin, Sabanin, sorry, yeah, would come in and and do hop hop keto. It was like, wow, I love this part of training. I really didn't take to um to uh, the other aspects of taekwondo, but hop keto, hi. We have a visitor. Yeah, he wants to be part of things. It's okay. Come on in, be a visitor here. <laughs> but um, but the hot keto part of it was very intriguing, and I love the 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 um, things that, that we learned in hot keto. And then when I saw some detail, I was like, ah, oh, this is exactly what I wanted to learn. It's just it's better than hot keto. It's it's definitely um, a joy to transition from wherever you come from. So I don't I don't think I've met anybody who's joined the dojo and said I want to go back to what I did before. I, I don't think I've met anybody. We have people from kung fu. We have people from karate. From uh, all different kinds of really, um, sure. You know, and nobody ever returned. I don't think. You know? It's definitely a different mindset. Um, a different mindset. Once once you get in, it's, it's a it's a whole new world, and I would definitely say. Everybody I've spoken with enjoys our mindset, just the different perspective that we have to offer, um, especially just the rather more combative aspect of it. I did meet one guy once, and uh, it was very early. I was a Waka Sensei, and he said uh, he was a Taekwondo black belt. Oh, no, no, he was a Tung Sudo black belt. He was a Tung Sudo black belt. And, uh, and he said to me, uh, I really love your art. I love the things that you guys can do, but do you have any kata? He was big into forms. He was like, you know, the Japanese kata. I was like, no. Well, not like you know them. We have two-man kata, like these ancient forms. We don't have any like modern, you know, kata. And he was like, oh, I, that's my favorite part. And his thing was like, it was a fitness routine, and he really liked the posing, and he really liked the... He's like, how am I going to compete? How am I going to go for my trophies if you don't have cover? And he just, it wasn't for him. So it does happen. It's not like it does but he never joined in the first place. He was just like, if it doesn't have cover, then I, I don't want any part of it. Mm. So for us, it's the end all be all, for sure. But it's, you know, some people aren't interested in combat, which is hard to believe. But people join martial arts for different reasons. Kata, really? And he did not, he wasn't interested in combat. He was like, are you kidding me? I'm never going to fight. I don't want to fight. I, I like, want to pose. <laughs> well, it's the truth. In my experience, and again, I might get chastised because I don't have my history notes with me, so I'm going off the top of my head. It's been a couple of years. But uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Chuck Norris uh, started in Kung Sudo, and he holds a uh, 10th degree black belt currently, and he got very high ranking before he moved on to other things. So. A lot of times in my experience in the different competitions that I went to over the course of the couple months that I was training, a lot of people held that, you know, Tung Sudo chip on their shoulder because it's what Chuck Morse does. And they were very, they loved the, yeah, the theatrical posing. And Chuck, you moved on, though. He did. Did, did. did a lot of jiu-jitsu. I mean, he did. you know, I got, I got the opportunity to speak with uh, Bob Wall a bunch of times and we hung out and uh, he was a great guy. And he's Chuck Norris's partner. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bob told me multiple times all the different things that Chuck got into. I mean, he got into um, a very early age. He got into uh, the low kicks of uh, both. They both did. Bob all did too. 
uh, the low kicks of uh, Muay Thai. And then they moved into uh, Jiu Jitsu before most people did, before they even knew about it. So. I believe when I, right around when I first joined, we were actually in the process of putting together a video demonstration for, for Chuck Norris. He had wanted to see what we were about, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Yeah, that video is on our YouTube channel. Yeah. Check it out. Check it out. I Chuck put a link there. Chuck liked it. <laughs> <laughs> we actually cut it up. We didn't even put the whole thing on. We well, should we should find that video in its entirety and stick the whole thing on. It, it, it's a long one. What was it, like 20, 25 minutes? Yeah. It's pretty long. Wild. Yeah. We chopped it up because at the time YouTube wouldn't let you put on a long video. More than 10 minutes. So we stuck a little parts of it on. But now we should throw the whole thing on. Why not? Thank you.